for more, Dr. Blair Truin, climate scientist with the World Med Organization, joins us from Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Truin, thank you very much for joining us on the show. I have to start by asking you, every time we get a report, the climate story seems to be getting worse, but what makes the 2023 reward, uh, report rather particularly alarming? In 2023, we saw uh, global temperatures break records by uh, quite a substantial margin. Uh, uh, they were almost 0.2 of a degree above the previous uh, warmest recorded year, and that's uh, a very large margin for us to be breaking records by. Uh, over the last few decades, temperatures have generally been warming at a rate of uh, about 0.2 to 0.25 degrees per decade. And when we get records, they generally happen by maybe a few hundredths of a degree. To, so to see the previous warmest recorded year broken by such a wide margin was uh, significant, probably particularly so uh, because uh, it wasn't happening at the end of an El Nino. Most of our previous record years, like 2016, have happened at the end of an El Nino. So uh, we perhaps wouldn't have been so surprised to see uh, those numbers this year in 2024, but to get them in 2023 right at the start of an El Nino was actually uh, uh, quite unexpected. Dr. Truin, there has been a pretty aggressive push for renewable energy, uh, but in the report it says the long lifetime of greenhouse gases, such as CO2, it really means that temperatures will continue to rise for many years to come, even if we stop pumping these gases today. Is it too late? Uh, well, it's not, it's not too late, but, uh, you know, the Best, best, the best time to start was 20 years ago. The uh, next best time to start is now, so to speak. Uh, but it is true that uh, uh, there is quite a long lag time between a change in uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions trajectory and what that impacts on the climate. And that's largely because uh, uh, it takes about 20 years for a whole Earth energy system to get into balance, particularly the deep ocean. So, uh, what you see is if you look at uh, the difference between uh, you know, very high range greenhouse gas emission scenarios and much lower range scenarios is that the uh, projected temperatures with those are pretty similar uh, for the next 10 to 20 years, uh, but then they diverge pretty sharply in the low scenarios. We see stabilisation in the high scenarios. We see continued warming. So, you know, what that means is that... Uh, yeah, regardless of what happens to emissions, uh, continued warming is uh, more or less locked in over the next decade or two. But what happens now will potentially make a big difference to what happens after that. Mm. Dr. Truin, we're barely a quarter into the new year. Um, and I know the report you know, talks about this year being troubling. You mentioned it briefly as well. I mean, what are the early indicators saying that makes you know, uh, you know, this year as troubling, if not more troubling, than 2023? Yeah, well, as I said earlier, typically the uh, for warmest years globally are, are the years at the end of an El Nino event, which is uh, what 2024 is. Uh, the numbers we've seen in the first couple of months of 2024 are still record levels for this time of year, uh, but perhaps not quite so much off the scale as we were seeing uh, in the later part of 2023. So, uh, you know, if we compare, for example, to 2016, which was the last big El Nino year, uh, February came in about 0.1 of a degree warmer than 2016, so that uh, gives you an indication of how things are tracking. And typically, uh, you know, as, as the El Nino fades, as we expected to over coming months, uh, we would expect to see global temperatures uh, moderate a little bit in the later part of this year compared to where, where they are now. But, uh, you know, what we saw after 2016 is temperatures never returned to their uh, pre-2016 levels, and uh, we'd expect that uh, to be pretty similar this time round. So, you know, even if we get some less hot years in the next few years, uh, uh, you know, we would expect them to still be uh, warmer than anything we saw before last year. The WMO says the number of people going hungry around the world has more than doubled in the past four years. Uh, what happened, Dr. Truin? Uh, can you talk to us about the connection between climate and food insecurity? Yes, well, that, that's a particular issue in, uh, you know, in some parts of the world and, uh, uh, you know, especially uh, areas such as uh, Africa and South Asia. And if we look at, uh, you know, at Africa, for instance, uh, 
uh, the Greater Horn of Africa region in East Africa uh, had uh, actually had a very severe long-term drought from 2023 to 2022. Uh, and then things actually flipped around in 2023 and they had uh, significant flooding, particularly later in the year. And that, uh, uh, you know, that shifted from one extreme to the other in, uh, uh, you know, in a short period of time. That's a you know, difficult thing for uh, agriculture to cope with. These are areas which are... Uh, uh, you often suffer from food insecurity, uh, even under ideal climate conditions. Uh, uh, you know, often for reasons other than climate. But uh, uh, you know, when you get extreme climate events as well, a lot of those more vulnerable areas are you know are tipped over the edge into uh, you know, more extreme uh, forms of food insecurity. Dr. Truwin, um, I know you get asked this a lot. Climate experts, government ministers, meeting later this week to press for greater climate action? How hopeful are you of leaders actually being going beyond statements and advancing policies to fight climate change? Yeah, well, the, I think one of the key things which emerges from the research which was, uh, uh, you know, which was summarised in the last uh, Intergovernment Department of Climate Change report, which came out uh, in 2021, is that... Uh, uh, stabilising the stabilising the climate long term requires uh, ultimately reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and also that the level at which that the climate stabilises depends on uh, uh, you know the quantity of emissions that occur before we reach net zero. So from that perspective, uh, uh, you know the sooner that uh, net zero can be reached globally, uh, the yeah, the lower the level the global temperatures will ultimately stabilise at, although that will still be a level somewhat above where we are now. Uh, let's end uh, with some positive uh, sentiments. The report did have some bright spots, though. Uh, what stood out for you, Professor? Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, I think, yeah, you know, picking up on that last point, one of the uh, you know, more encouraging things is that we're seeing, uh, we are seeing a rapid transition toward renewable energy in many parts of the world. Uh, but I think another bright spot uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, you know, when we look at uh, some of the high impact events which were covered in those reports, now those, you know, certainly had major impacts. But if we look uh, at, you know, say at, uh, at tropical cyclones in Asia, uh, you know, we see that the number, you know, the number of deaths in tropical cyclones, particularly in South Asia, has declined dramatically over the last uh, uh, 20 to 30 years. And that's uh, uh, partly better weather forecasting, better early, partly better early warnings linked to that weather forecasting, and partly, uh, you know, more effective uh, uh, emergency responses to those events. So, you know, countries like Bangladesh, for example, have done an enormous amount of work in uh, you know, providing effective shelters for their communities during tropical cyclones, and that's uh, uh, you know, drastically reduced the number of casualties we see in those events. So we are taking steps in the right direction. Thank you very much for your insights this morning. Dr Blair Truin from the World Meteorological Organization.